I want you to uh, find these places in your Bible. One of them will be John, Gospel according to John, chapter 2. I'm going to give you a minute to find those. John, chapter 2. And also, when you're ready, I want you to find Isaiah. Middle of your Bible, Isaiah chapter 61. We'll be reading from Isaiah first. Isaiah 61, we'll be looking at the very beginning of that chapter as we refer to Jesus. The woman in this, I thought this was done so well and so powerfully because they didn't dress her up in the garb of the day. They kept her in the clothing we have now because it just relates so much more. The woman in the temple, there is a, is a Bible story, an account of a widow at the temple where Jesus watches her, but that's not this case. This is the case of the Passover. This is the Passover season, and this is a case where they picked this particular woman and they made her in the situation of a widow. She's not an actual Bible character, but she's a character that could be any one of us because we all have our vulnerabilities. Now, we call Jesus Savior, we call him Son of God, but do we really know who he is? Do we really have the kind of experience with him that he wants us to have? And when you look at this widow, when you look at her vulnerabilities, and you look at how she was touched by Jesus in the situation, the, the honesty is like is stark. It hits you in the face in the way she, she expresses this in this relationship. And I'm, I'm amazed at that because women are so much more upfront about stuff like that. They're so much on, they're very honest about themselves and, and, and they're in touch with their feelings. And guys are just not quite, quite that way. Men are not quite that way. A man sees himself as a protector. We are the, uh, the strong one, you know? It's like, never let him see you sweat. No chinks in the armor, you know? It's also like, for the longest time in our culture, men were never supposed to cry. You were not supposed to be seen crying in public. That was a sign of weakness. I think we've gotten past that now. I think we've gotten better with that. And I guess that's why maybe one of the greatest inventions that, as far as a man is concerned, in the last 20 or 30 years is the GPS. Yes. <laughs> because no more do we have to pull over and say, ask for directions, you know? It's like, I, I know what I'm doing kind of thing. Um, I want to read with you, if you'll read with me, from Isaiah, because the woman in the, in, the, in the video, the Galilean widow, said she no longer was afraid. She said she felt safe. What was the word she used at the end? She, she felt like she had been what? Rescued, right? That Jesus had done that for her. Now, Isaiah wrote these words. If you're there, look at Isaiah 61. Verses 1 and 2. And I want you to realize, before you read these with me, that Isaiah penned these words 740 years before Jesus showed up at that temple. 740 years this prophecy preceded him. And yet look how perfectly it describes him. The Spirit of the Lord is a, God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I want you to think for a moment what Jesus has rescued you from. What has Jesus delivered you from? Jesus stood up that day for the widow. But he stood up for every person in that temple who could not stand up for themselves. And that's what he does for all of us. Now, for a moment, I want you to just get, look, at my, look me in the eye here for a second. I'm going to change gears on you for a second here. Now, this, uh, I don't know how you feel about March, but this March has not been my favorite month. Yes. So when we turned on Monday to the first day of spring, I was like, yeah. And it was a beautiful sunny day. You remember how Monday was? First day of spring, like, yeah, this is it. All right. It didn't stay that way, but it was the first. Now, I, I, I have been so anticipating and waiting for spring. And I'm sorry to do this to you, but I want you to go back with me again just for a little bit into winter again. So 
So step back, be just for a few minutes to winter, and I want to take you back to a Christmas movie. A movie you probably know well. It's called The Christmas Story. How many have seen it? Nine-year-old Ralphie, right? Okay. So in the movie, nine-year-old Ralphie is really wanting to get... I mean, he's got his heart set on this one particular, particular gift. And, and the gift, according to Ralphie, is an official Red Ryder carbine 200 air rifle action with compass in the stock. And he wants this thing so bad he can taste it. The problem is his mom doesn't want him to have it, right? <laughs> his teacher also seems to be in cahoots with his mom because according to both of them, they say to him, you can't have it, it'll what? Shoot, Shoot your eyes out. <laughs> okay, right. So Ralphie goes on this campaign of trying to figure out how am I going to get this rifle? And he works his whole thing up where he, he writes his theme. He even tries, he, he's desperate. He goes to Santa Claus, trying to find some way around his mother's prejudice. In the process of the story, there's a bully. Every story's got a bully, right? A bad guy. This bully has got a coonskin hat on, and his name is Scott Farkas. And he's an evil little guy, and he terrorizes Ralphie, and he terrorizes his brother, Randy, and he terrorizes all of his friends. And it gets to the point of where finally, one day, Ralphie's walking home, you know the movie, and suddenly he gets, he gets nailed, right? The snowball hits him right over the glass, through the glass, into the eye, and Ralphie starts to cry. And that's what the bully has wanted all along. Because when he starts to cry, the frenzy, it's like, it's like shark in the water with blood. Oh, this is what I want. And, and as, as we're watching this, we begin to see this thing come over Ralphie. His face begins to change, and we're going like, yeah, get him, Ralphie, get him. And he jumps on Scott and begins to beat the Cheerios out of him, right? And his friends are all behind the chain link fence watching this, like, in amazement, but also a little afraid, but like, wow. And Ralphie is beating up the bully. Now, let's jump backwards again. Go back again now, 2,000 years earlier. And we go back to the temple. The cleansing of the temple is what we're looking at here. So let's look at John chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 13 through 22. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. What Ralphie did that day was a small portion of what Jesus did at the temple that day. He took care of the bullies. Now, as you're looking at John chapter 2, is there, a, is there a heading, a subheading in your text there? Okay, read it again. What is it again? Jesus clears, Jesus clears the temple. Now, I want you to take, if you have a pen, write this down for me. Because I want you to do, I hope you'll do this for me, for yourself. I'm going to give you three other places to check. Because the account of Jesus cleansing the temple is in all four Gospels, but it's not exactly the same. So I want you to check on your time. Please check Matthew chapter 21. And that would be verses 12 through 17. But Matthew 21, 12 through 17. Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 19. Mark 11, 12 through 19. And Luke 19, 45 through 48. Luke 19. 45 through 48. Now, if you will take the time to look at those portions of the, of the different Gospels, you will find a very interesting phenomenon. Every one of them has a subheading that talks about Jesus the cleansing the temple, but they're not the same subheading because the situation is not the same. The three of them we just mentioned here, John, excuse me, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are the same event. The one we're looking at here in John is not the same event. So as, as you take the time, and Lord giving you some insight into this, you'll find some really interesting things here. And I think God will speak to you. I can't take time to do it today with you. So I'm asking you to take time and the Lord bless you with this. So uh, in verse um, 13 of John chapter 2, we read, It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. And so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle and sheep and dove for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep 
the cattle and scattered the money changers, coins all over the floor. He turned over the tables. By the way, that's where the expression comes from. Let's turn the tables. That's where it comes from. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. Did I just repeat that? Let me just see where I am here. Okay, so... Verse 16 reads again, Then going over to the people who drove with the dubs, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. The whip that Jesus constructed, and we'll get back to the other verses a little later. The whip that Jesus constructed was a knotted, it wasn't going to really hurt anybody. It had knots on the end of it, rope, but it was certainly going to sting. And he drove out the two-legged and the four-legged animals from the temple. Now the video, the video says with the widow... I felt protected. I want you to try and get a, a picture in your mind of what this might have looked like. Um, there were coins flying everywhere. You've got several different kinds of bullies in the temple, and here's what you've got. You've got a table set up with money changers. We'll talk about them in a second. You've got Booths with merchants who have doves and animals, and you've got Pharisees on the side who are going to basically take control of everything, tell people how to do everything. So what's going on with all of this? There are probably between 3,000 and 4,000 people at that temple that day. They're in the outer court of the temple. This is also called the Court of the Gentiles. And when you think about what happened in Israel at that time, in Judea, really what it was called at that time, Rome, the Roman government had taken over the country. And so you used everything that was Roman currency. You dealt with, if you wouldn't actually deal with coin, you dealt with Roman currency. But when you went to the temple, you couldn't use Roman currency. You couldn't use Roman coin. So therefore, you had to make an exchange, change your money for temple currency or the currency of the time for the Jewish people. On top of that, there were people who inspected, the Levites, who inspected the animals. If you brought an animal with you from a distance, the animal had to be perfect. It had to be without blemish. And if there was any spot of any kind on the animal, the animal would be rejected. And of course, on the side are waiting the merchants who can sell you an animal that has been pre-approved by the priests. Are you getting the picture here? So there is a business transaction going on here. The woman in the video, the poor people, really couldn't afford to bring an animal, and they, they couldn't transport even a bird. So when they got there, they had to. They were forced to buy a sacrifice, an animal for sacrifice. Everyone had to have the sacrifice for the Passover. So there were something like three or 4,000 people milling around the outside of the courts, there are merchants who are ready to sell you the animal, but at a very high price, because this is the holiday, Passover. You have the merchants who are going to exchange the money first so that you can actually buy the, the uh, animal. And they are going to exchange at a rate that's very favorable to them. They will control the rate of exchange. When Jen and I traveled in Italy, uh, we had spent two weeks over in different parts of Italy. We couldn't use U.S. currency. We had to use euros and as we were there the the rate of american dollar kept dropping significantly so we thought we had enough money with us but every time we would use the money the, the value of it kept going down so we had to keep exchanging dollars for for euros and every time we were losing 40 cents on the dollar and basically that's what's happening over at the temple they're exchanging the money they're giving temple currency in exchange for Roman coin. And then you move over from that. Once you've been raked over by that, you move over to the, the marketplace where you're going to now buy the animal, and they're going to rake you over. And the Pharisees are taking something into the table. And the Pharisees now will make you step up and tell you, no, you can't worship that way. You have to worship this way. You can't pray this way. This is how you kneel. This is what you say. This is what you do. And the people are completely bullied. Now, what's supposed to be happening there? At a place like this, at the house of God, 
the temple, you are going to seek the Lord on a special day, on this day of Passover, the Passover holiday, which is also called the Feast of Eleven Bread, which again points to Jesus himself, Jesus' broken body, unleavened, without sin. And instead of being able to worship God, you've got animals squawking, birds squealing, you've got money being thrown everywhere and exchanged back and forth, and you're bartering and yelling, and there's almost no way you could really worship. And this is what Jesus sees when he gets to the temple. Now, let me just make this clear, that this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This is the beginning of it. And there are some people who say, well, Jesus didn't really get angry. He was too holy for that. Really? Well, it says that he experienced all the same things that we did and that he had all the same emotions that we did. And I think he was extremely angry and extremely upset at what he found there that day. And he took action with it. And he made that whip, his carpenter skills quickly put together that whip, and he drove out the two-legged and the four-legged animals that day. He turned over the tables and things were flying everywhere. (coughs) And I imagine, as the woman in the video felt safe, I can imagine for the first time, some of the people said to themselves, wow, this person is standing up for us. And not everybody felt that way, of course, because there were bullies who felt very much the opposite. Now, have you ever observed someone being singled out by a bully? In fact, I know you have because all of us have seen it. You may have even been a target yourself at one point in time of a bully. I know that as a a young man, there was someone who uh, became a mentor to me. He was like, uh, he was my athletic coach and later on became uh, a person I worked with as a teacher. He was a counselor and he he meant so much to me. He always always did. Uh, And he was the guy that would step in the gap for you when there was a problem. And I always appreciated that and always admired him for it and later had a chance to work with him. In one of my eighth grade classes, as a teacher who taught for 33 years, in one of my eighth grade classes, one particular time, I remember this clearly, there was a young girl, she was 13 years old, she was Hispanic. She didn't speak a lot of English, and so because of that, uh, she was even more isolated even from the other girls. She was shy. Um, there weren't a lot of Hispanic influence a different type of younger people at that time. We have a lot more coming into our country now, but not as many then. And because she was a perfect target, and because she seemed like she was alone, a young man who was really kind of like a, the big shot of the crowd, the guy who stands out, the guy who was well-dressed, the guy who was outspoken, the guy who had a following behind him, he was her Scott Farkas. And he went after her, and he began to make her life miserable. And because she couldn't defend herself, and because she couldn't speak much English, he would just, he was relentless. And day after day, I would pull him on the side and say to him, you're going to knock this off. And he had his lackeys, had three or four people with him. And then finally, after days of this, and seeing her upset every day and leaving almost in tears every day, I finally said, this is the end of it. We're putting an end to this. And in front of the class, I pulled him up and I said to him, do you know what sexual harassment is? And we were just kind of starting with that stuff then. And he looked at me and he he didn't say anything. I said, well, what are you doing right now to this young woman? I said, sexual harassment. I said, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to take her, walk her down to the office, and I'm going to show her how to file papers against you. And if you do this one more time, I'm going to do this while you're here. And we're going to have you reported, and maybe it'll have you arrested. And guess what? He never did it again. The bully decided that it wasn't worth the trouble. Now, I wonder if you've done that same sort of thing, someone in your life, or if someone's done that for you. And I wonder also if that isn't what God wants us to do for each other and also for people who are not part of the body of Christ. You know, we get the wrong idea. Sometimes we look at this as like it's, it's the Christians against the rest of the world. Like we have to surround, us, surround ourselves and protect ourselves from the rest of the world. That's not what it is. That's not what God's called us to do. 
What the Lord has asked us to do is he's asked us to go out to the world, to bring his love, to bring his life, to bring his strength. And sometimes even stand up against the, the, the powers of darkness that are in this world that are coming against people, that you become his champion, that you take on the bully and you defend someone who can't defend themselves. Bullies come in all shapes and sizes. I guess the worst kind of bully is the one that attacks a person's spirit. A person can be bullied by their past. Your past, if you allow it, can break you down. It can pull you back into what you were, tell you what you were, and make it impossible for you to break free and tell you you have no future. Bullies can drag us down by burdens of debt if we're involved with that, that threaten, threaten to strangle us. Bullies can trap us and haunt us by addictions. For some people, that is a nightmare, a living nightmare. You can be frightened to death by a life situation, fears that seem overabundance, all-encompassing. Sometimes it seems like there's no way out of these things, and the bully tells you that there's no hope. And they can taunt you and take control of you and try and destroy you. But here's the good news that Jesus has defeated the bully. Jesus has come to turn the tables. If you are suffering from a situation, he's come to turn the tables in your life. And he wants you to stand up and do the same for others. If you need to be rescued, he's already taken care of the business. It's only a matter of us recognizing that he's done it already. This 40 days that I was talking about earlier with Jesus... It's more than a theme. It's a chance for a spiritual awakening. I don't know if you guys are involved with anything like that, but here's how it works. You find a way to give time to the Lord. If nothing else, if it's not involved with you giving something up or fasting over something or seeking God for something special, every, every part of it, no matter how you do it, is involved with time. You have to take time from something in your life, giving up time from somewhere, some way, so you can give it back to God. Now that might mean taking time by getting up earlier in the morning for a special time of prayer with him. It, be, it might mean time of taking away from something you do, you do normally, something you really enjoy. Maybe it, it could be something dealing with sports. It could be something dealing with some kind of a hobby. But you take time away from something so that you, you actually give up something because what you're really doing is getting something. Somehow God works with that in special kinds of ways. When we give up something that is meaningful to us, it's amazing how he gives us something that's even more meaningful back. It's a chance to hear his voice in a different kind of a way. So that's what this idea of putting aside these, this time with Jesus, these 40 days. Our journey here as Christians needs to be safeguarded. I want to share this with you too. Andy Stanley had a series. Anybody know who ever listened to Andy Stanley? Son of Charles Stanley. He's very gifted, especially with younger people and people who are not believers. And he talked about guardrails, guardrails in a Christian's life, guardrails. When you're driving along the highway and you're looking along the side, there are guardrails. In the median, there are guardrails. Sometimes when you're going along sharp turn roads, there are guardrails. The guardrail is not the danger. The guardrail is the warning. What's beyond the guardrail is the danger. Collision with another car, going over a cliff. The guardrail you don't want to hit because the guardrail is going to to hurt when you hit it. But the guardrail is warning Christians that this is where the the warning is because beyond that guardrail is the edge. And the edge is where the danger is. Now, what is the edge in a Christian's life? The edge is a self-centered, self-absorbed life. The edge is having us be in control and not him in control. And we can't let that happen. The Pharisees thought they were serving God. The Pharisees thought they were doing a good thing for God and for God's people. Instead, they were oppressing God's people because they had lost contact or sight in what was right and what was wrong. Because they had become self-absorbed and self-centered. 
And we can't let that happen. The guardrails keep us from that kind of edge. But only spending time with the Lord opens our eyes so we can see where we are and where he wants to take us to. We can be there for each other because there are times where we are, if not the hurting widow, we are the hurting person. And we need to know that God's strength is around us. We also need to know that our, the friends our people are around us as well. If you will deny yourself, and I'm just encouraging you to do this for this short time, you won't lose anything. You'll discover that God will come fresh to you, refreshing to you in a new way. Now, what I didn't get to read were the last verses of that portion of Scripture. So let's take a second. Let me see if I can find that. I'm actually missing my portion, so I'm going to look this up right now. So look again at John chapter 2. And I'm looking at verse 16. Let me go back to it again. Going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Don't turn my father's house to a marketplace. The disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house burns within me. Verse 18. What right do you have to do these things? The Jewish leaders demanded. If you have this authority from God, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. Always asking for a sign. And one thing about Jesus, he would never let himself be manipulated, ever. So oftentimes you'll see people ask him for a sign and he's just not going to do it. But it's interesting his comments here. Verse 19 says, All right, the words of Jesus. All right, he replied. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And in verse 20, it says, what they exclaimed? It took 40 years to build this temple, and you couldn't do it in three days? But the temple Jesus meant was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed both Jesus and the scriptures. I want to close with this. This whole thing about the temple, Jesus said, destroy this temple. He was talking about his body. What was he saying? He was saying that the Old Testament times are done. John the Baptist, last Old Testament prophet, John baptized Jesus, and that day was the beginning, ushering of a new time, a new period. What period? The kingdom of God has come to us. It was right there. The prophecy of Isaiah was right there. When Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up, he's talking about his death and what? Resurrection. Crucifixion's resurrection. But he's talking about the temple, and he's talking about also cleansing the temple is a way of cleansing us as well. The Lord has made a way for us to be cleansed, and the time is right now. And no matter what might be in your way, no matter what might be harboring situations against you, whatever bully might be against you, the Lord has made that way because he drives out the bully from the temple. Whatever might be troubling you, whatever might be on your mind, whatever might be in your heart, I know that I've been dealing with my own special things. and The Lord has been reassuring me in my own life that he's in control always. Your feelings might not agree with it. Sometimes your heart and mind might not agree with it. But your spirit will agree with it because God is in control and he cares about your life. And he has... Form that whip to drive out that bully. Now, would it be okay if I close in prayer here? Lord, nobody more personable than you. 
It's amazing how you make the time available to us always. Any moment of the day we go to you, you're there. We're not waiting online. We're not having to leave a message. Lord, can you get back to me later? Lord, you are there waiting for us when we come to you. And when you refer to yourself as our Heavenly Father, that's exactly what you mean. Now today, Lord, as we have listened to your word, let, oh God, the portions of the word that each person here needs sink deep into their heart. If they need a healing, Lord, today, provide that healing. If they need strength or encouragement today, provide that encouragement, that strength. If they need direction today, Lord, that you provide that direction. If they need, Lord, assistance, oh God, in some way, that you would provide that assistance. If they need, Lord, a way out of a problem that they can't find, that today, Lord, new hope would spring up, oh God, that you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. It's not about what we do. It's about, Lord, putting our faith and our trust in you, giving you the time to accomplish the things that you wish to accomplish in our lives. And then, Lord, let you take that life, our life, the life you've given to us, and then apply it, Lord, in ministry to others. Let this body of believers, Lord, minister to one another and to the people you send them to this week. And Father, once more, again, we pray, Lord, for Pastor Vinny, for Kathy. We pray you'd bring them back, Lord, next week in strength, Lord. We pray that the support they need would be here, Father. And Lord, that some of the challenges that they're facing, Lord, that you would provide the support and strength, oh Lord, that they need. Now, as we close, Lord, uh, in prayer, we do not close from your presence. We want to continue to enjoy your presence, Lord, the rest of this day and throughout this week. And we ask these things in the wonderful, compassionate, and mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.
without fear, without wonder, with just trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.